This podcast is a talk by Andrew Flood on revolutionary organization in the age of networked individualism. You'll find more audio on the WSM website at www.wsm.ie slash audio. Revolutionary Organization in the Age of Networked Individualism The revolutions and revolts that swept the world in 2011 took almost everyone by surprise. One of the first strong attempts to explain why they happened is Paul Mason's Why It's Kicking Off Everywhere. He argues that the materialist explanation for 2011 is as much about individuals versus hierarchies as it is about rich against poor. By far the most provocative element of his book is the idea that communications technology, in particular the internet, is transforming the way people behave and that a significant contribution to the revolts of 2011 lie in these changes. If he's right, it it has profound consequences for the form and structure of revolutionary organisations, including anarchist ones. In Mason's book, the new people are the networked individuals. One critic of the concept, Barry Wellman, provides this useful summary of what he terms networked individualism. He says it is the move from densely knit and tightly bounded groups to sparsely knit and loosely bounded networks. Each person is a switchboard between ties and networks. People remain connected, but as individuals rather than being rooted in the home bases of work units and household. Each person operates a separate personal community network and switches rapidly among multiple sub-networks. The organic and multi-dimensional relationship of communities are being transformed into narrow, digitally enabled, highly individualized networked relationships. Perhaps most widely recognizable as Facebook friendings accompanied by Facebook likings as a possible substitute for shared community values and norms. Mason uses sociologist Richard Sinnott's conception of the networked individual as one with weak ties, multiple loyalties and greater autonomy. Mason shows how the individual freedoms that were won in the period from the late 1960s were not, as many think, a unique step forward in history. In terms of such freedoms, we are not in fact always moving forward making gains. Gains won, can and have been rolled back by reaction, sometimes slowly and sometimes in jumps. He references the period before World War I and its zeitgeist of globalised trade, technological progress and sexual liberation, followed by a century of economic crisis, militarism, genocide and totalitarian rule. Referring to the movement of the 1960s and the 1962 Port Huron Statement in particular, he rejects the idea that the break with collectivism that statement represented was the doomed precursor of neoliberalism, and instead argues that it failed because it was premature. Premature because technology was not developed enough to allow freedom for the majority, and premature because The forces of collectivism, nationalism and corporate power were at that point stronger than the forces fighting against them. The Network Effect At the heart of the concept of the networked individual is the network effect. Basically, the more people that use a network, the more useful it is. If you were the first person in the world with a phone, it would have been no use. When two people had a phone, it would still have been of very limited use to either of them. The more people had phones, the more useful they became to each individual with a phone. They become more useful to everyone in the phone network when everyone not only has a phone, but has it on them all the time. One statistic stood out for me in the entire book. Facebook put on six-sevenths of its user base in the three years after Lehman's Brothers went bust. In terms of the network effect, this means we should have expected a massive increase in Facebook's influence in that time, far more than the 600% growth alone would suggest. The network effect is the reason so many of us are stuck using Facebook even though we dislike its corporate greed, unethical methods and used by the police and other state forces as a surveillance tool. Almost all of us make the judgement that these disadvantages, all of which are significant, are outweighed by the advantage of not only being able to reach out to hundreds of similar activists but also thousands or even hundreds of thousands of random folk. There are attempts to set up alternative activist social network sites but very few of us use them because the only people there are a rather small minority of other activists. The transformation of people. The argument Mason makes is not trivial. These communication technologies are transforming people. In the book, he launches into a description of how the transformation of people who play multi-user online computer games affects real-world interactions. A woman tweeting at work or from the front line of a demonstration is experiencing the same shared consciousness, role play, multifaceted personality and intense bonding that you would get in World of Warcraft. 
He follows up a listing of tweets about Libya that he received over 10 minutes with the comment that this beats any 10 minutes of Counter-Strike ever played. Later, in the same chapter, he returns to the theme, saying, Observers of the early factory system described how, within a generation, it had wrought a total change in the behaviour, thinking, body shape, and life expectancy of those imprisoned within it. People grew smaller, their limbs became bent, physical movements became more regimented, family units broke down. Why should a revolution in knowledge and technology not be producing an equally frantic, but diametrically opposed change in human behaviour? The use of social networks substitutes for the strong ties that used to exist among workers when we all left the same streets every morning to work in the same factories or down the same mine. Under such conditions, the social pressure to stand by your fellow workers and act collectively was enormous, but your connections seldom extended far from that pit village or industrial district. You were dependent on the union or partly leadership for coordination and information from afar. The ties generated by networks may be very much weaker, they require very little commitment, but they also have a very much greater reach. The orthodox left tends to bemoan and wish for a return to those earlier days when mass labour-intensive factories concentrated and disciplined thousands of workers in the way that both Leninist parties and many unions found useful. It's no coincidence that leftist terminology from that period is riddled with military terms and analogies. The working class was literally an army that was ordered into battle. Left to one side in that longing for the old days is that while these methods might have looked efficient on paper, in historical reality they were a disaster. The imposed centralised discipline created the mechanisms by which small, well-meaning or otherwise, minorities could impose an increasingly brutal discipline to ensure that what the party considered the correct course was taken. Stalin's gulags could not have existed without the centralised discipline required to command millions to both enter and operate that system. In 1956, at the British Communist Party's conference, those few who tried to raise the Russian invasion of Hungary were drowned out by mass chants of discipline, discipline. The role of the revolutionary organisation in the networked age. If the central thesis of the book is correct, that is, that the advent of mass one-to-many communication in the form of the internet is transforming both production and the way people behave, then there is a strong argument to radically re-examine everything we understand by revolutionary organisation. This, after all, is a very, very different situation than that faced by any previous generation of revolutionaries for whom mass communication was non-existent, unless you'd already built the mass organisation that could produce, finance and distribute a daily paper. What is our model? The current model of revolutionary organisation for all of the far left and most of the anarchist movement draws on organisational models that are derived from the organisations built onto the old factory system. That is, they are based on strong ties between people and a relatively high level of discipline, either self or collectively agreed in the case of anarchism, or imposed from above in the case of the various types of Leninism. Anarchist organisations tended to allow considerably more autonomy to local sections, but they were still largely expected to stay within the confines set by the decisions of regular conferences and statements of aims and principles. They certainly are not based on weak ties and multiple loyalties. In men, indeed, many anarchist organisations would rule out being a member of other anarchist organisations. The point here is not that the new tendency towards weak ties, multiple loyalties and greater autonomy makes it impossible to construct such organisations. Clearly, they continue to exist and recruit, as is the case for unions, which are organised on the same basic lines but limit themselves to the economic sphere of struggle. The point is that perhaps it is no longer possible to imagine these organisations built in the sort of mass forms that would be needed to coordinate revolution, as once happened in Russia in 1917 or Spain in 1936. We are also at least a decade into a process where it has become apparent that attempts to impose that old model of organisation on the emerging movement have shown very little success and in many cases have done considerable damage. There is little to be gained from a debate over whether these changes are good, bad or indifferent for revolutionaries. The point is they have and are happening. We either find new ways of organising around weak ties, multiple loyalties and greater autonomy, or we retire to the sidelines to comment, archive and hold the occasional meeting about the Spanish Revolution. Giving full consideration to this question is the task of another article, or indeed a shelf of books and decades of experimentation. But what can be said is that we are talking here not of a theory but of an emerging process that can already be observed and learned from. One that is over a decade old. 
from Zapatista to Solidarity to the Seattle WTO protest through to, to, to Tahir, Real Democracy and Occupy, the methods of the old left have not been to the forefront of emerging moments of struggle. Instead, we have seen the development of, largely new, of a largely new set of structures and methodologies that do indeed reflect the weak ties, multiple loyalties and greater autonomy of those drawn into involvement. Where the terrain has been such that the advantages of le the left organisations in terms of concentration of resources has put them in the driving seat, the result has often been ugly and disempowering. The old left controlled the anti-war movement at the time of the 2003 invasion of Iraq and was unable to do anything to slow or halt the drive to war despite the mass opposition. The old left, if we understand it to include the union leadership, controlled the mass union marches and token strikes of 2008 to 2010 and were unable to halt or even slow the drive to austerity. In both cases, the price of failure included massive levels of demoralisation that made many less willing to engage in future activity, even if it also resulted in an angry minority. Just about the only terrain the old left has advanced on in Ireland is the electoral one. This perhaps is not only because the crisis has made anti-capitalist politics popular, but more fundamentally because the crisis of organisation arising from this new age of weak ties, multiple loyalties and greater autonomy is destroying the traditional organisations of the political party system of the right at a great, if not greater rate than it has destroyed those of the left. The meteoric rise of the Tea Party network over the more traditional Republicans in the Republican Party in the US is one example. The electoral gains of the left are of course also on a terrain that is best suited to weak ties, multiple loyalties and greater autonomy. Taking three minutes to vote for someone every five years is a very weak commitment. This is why, while tens or hundreds of thousands voted for the radical left at the election, the next demonstrations called by the same organisations attracted only hundreds. In the last couple of years, many on the left, including the WSM, have started to try to shift their organisational structures and engagement models from the traditional forms to new forms. In Ireland, initiatives like Claiming a Future are very obviously based on trying to, trying to find ways to work with a large network of people with weak ties, multiple loyalties and greater autonomy, rather than to try and recruit them into a single organisation. There is probably a very interesting question around just how conscious such organisations are that they are, they are attempting a fundamental transformation and how much it is simply a reaction to the changing world around us, and in particular the new technologies that are available. Lessons from the summit protests my experiences in the early summit protest movement led me to sit down and write a relatively detailed discussion of the emerging networks and the role of technology in revolutionary politics back in 2004. This was published as Summit Protests and Networks. The argument I made back in 2004 was that while some see the two organisational methods as in competition with each other, this need not be so. In fact, for anarchists, both forms should be complementary as the strengths of one are the weaknesses of the other, and vice versa.